I love my church. Frankly, I don't know why the idea of underwriters came to my mind. The dictionary associates this term almost exclusively with the insurance business. But I look at an old beat-up dictionary every now and then that is never content to leave well enough alone. And so there were some other definitions. One of them, guarantors of success. And the one that I appreciated very much, facilitator. Facilitator. I love my church. Jealous for her honor, her name, her theology, her standards, her lifestyle. I love how God blesses her in spite of incessant satanic attacks coming both from without and within. I've always been that way. I can read in one of our journals about a triumph of truth a thousand miles away, and I rejoice, not knowing a single person involved. More than that, I can read of two Adventist believers who happen to be in love and get married, and I say, thank the Lord, and I don't know them either. Another triumph of God's love. I even confess to a tinge of joyful satisfaction when I'm on the highway and I pass a big rig, and on the side it says, Little Debbie. Or if I'm one of... If I'm behind one of these cement behemoths and on the mud flap it says McNeilis, I'm connected then. Somebody told me that on the beltway near our home they saw a white van and on the side it said three angels' messages, plumbing and heating. Bless the Lord for those who have this sense of obligation to witness. And that plumbing and heating contractor certainly had a good starting point when he pulled into the yard. My dear friends, we have a relatively small church, I suppose, with a gigantic task. In my files at home, I have an article written by a priest of the Roman church. And he said there are only two world churches, ours and the Seventh-day Adventist church. And this is incredible to him, that a church so small could have such a world view. The very idea that we can gratefully bear the burden of carrying the truth into all the world is, to say the least, a stretch of faith. And we certainly believe in it. We are undaunted because we know that God is with his movement. Now, God is a supreme pragmatist. Did you ever hear the gospel song, Have you got any rivers they say are uncrossable? You got any tunnels or any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in the seemingly impossible, doing what no other one can do. I believe every word of that song. And a realization of that truth breeds in us an attitude of dependence on God. On the other hand, an attitude of self-sufficiency is perhaps our greatest threat. When we fall into that trap, it causes us to forsake God's mission and eventually to forsake Him and to spend our wealth lavishing it on ourselves and each other or our own group. And remember, wealth is a relative term. To a poor man, $50 is wealth. And when we turn inward like that and begin to do it for ourselves and our families, our own group, then social and moral degeneracy follows. And after that, spiritual deterioration until we are outside the family of God. Ellen White tells us that God's purposes No, no defeat. I love that. Now let's go way back to Egyptian bondage. Rather, let's see it coming to its end, prophetically. Let us think about the Exodus movement. 
It was time to establish a sanctuary with its elemental truths and for keeping the covenant that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Eventually, the branch, Shiloh, the woman's seed, would have to be illustrated in the sanctuary, this theater in the desert. The hand of Pharaoh was forced by the irresistible power of our living God and his word. And every Egyptian who practiced cruel oppression against these subjugated people and dead call themselves masters and God's people slaves, every one of them would be brought low. And then the time came when the leader said, let us go. Now, they were not going to build a sanctuary out of sand and desert stones and thistles. This sanctuary would be made of the finest materials, metals, jewels, tapestries, and skin. How could it be done? God got the attention of the Egyptians with the plagues and then stirred them up to a marvelous and strange generosity so that they, seeing the Jews leave, pulled off their golden earrings, their bracelets, their anklets, their precious stones, and gave them gladly to these despised ex-slaves. These treasures would be converted into a splendid sanctuary. Did you hear what I said? God was using the Egyptians to underwrite his purpose, his purposes in the wilderness. And they did it unwittingly. We used to tell folk who were about to be baptized into our church to take those things off and use them for the building up of the cause of God. God then led them to the Red Sea, and they had two immediate problems. The first was how to get across with the Egyptians pursuing from behind. And the second was to face the fact that the land on the other side was filled with pagans, hostile nations, and their lurid heathenism. So, Peter's army assayed to pursue them into the Red Sea. And when they did, the Bible says, something happened. And after that, Israel saw, the Bible says, Israel saw the Egyptians dead by the seashore. Think of the turbulence, the mighty turbulence of the surrendering sea. It should have buried all of them beneath the bottom sands. But instead... It swept them up on shore, and God allowed his people to look at them. Now, you think that's something? Consider this. They not only were swept up on shore, but they were still wearing iron and copper mail. Iron swords were by their sides. Iron helmets on their heads. Their shields, made of sturdy metal, had floated. God washed all of these things up for practical use to supply Joshua's small army with the ordnance it needed in order to face enemies on his journey toward the promised land. Now Joshua was chief of staff. In the heat of battle, he needed to be identifiable so the people would know who was giving the orders. So I imagine Joshua walking down the beach considering these people until he came to the cadaver of Pharaoh himself, special armor. And he took that. Pharaoh's officers were there. And they took all of these things, but they couldn't use them yet. First of all, Bezalel had to remove the trappings of heathenism. Things that glorified Ra and Isis and Osiris. And then refit them with Hebrew expressions of faith. As they marched across that wilderness, they were still a helpless group. 
when they came upon one crowd too big, too overpowering for them to match, God said, stand aside. And he sent in his army of hornets. Now, when an army of hornets gets behind you, it's time to move. And you don't have time to consider the things you should carry along with you. So they left all of these provisions behind, and all Israel had to do was go out and collect. They were on a mission for God. The mission was to get God's people to the promised land. They made tribal banners. But the most important identifying sign of all was the true Sabbath, a distinguishing sign. The heathen would hear about it. Even without email and websites and telephones, they would hear. God is God, you know. The Bible says about God, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I used to love to drive in the West, and I would see thousands of cattle numbering them by the head. God didn't number his by the head, but by the hills. He is abundant in his possessions. Not only that, he has promised that the forces of the Gentiles would come to his people. They would become underwriters of his will, his promises, his work. Centuries later, we come to Bethlehem. A raving beast sat on the throne in Judah. A pretender he was. Wicked, vicious, unconscionable. So much so that at a certain point he ordered all the young boys in Bethlehem put to death. Just in time, God said to Joseph and to Mary, take the child and go into Egypt to be succored there until this foolishness is over. Now, I have thought about that many a time. A poor man waking up in the middle of the night and being told to go on a trip to a foreign country. When I left to go off to college and eventually got there, that was the longest journey I had made in all of my life until that time. I knew men in my community who had never gone out of town. People didn't travel as they do now. Once or twice, some young person in my community would come and visit New York for just one week, and they would come home with an accent. And we would gather around to hear about the wonders up north. God told this man, get up and take your family down to Egypt until this wrath is over. Jesus had come to his own. His own received him not. He was also on the devil's turf. God's people had the prophecies, or as we like to put it, they had the truth. The time of the coming of the Messiah had been, had been denoted by Daniel. If they had studied the sanctuary truth rather than attaching superfluous traditions to what had been the truth, they might have been expecting him. Micah named the place where he would be born. They should have been looking toward Bethlehem. Now the shepherds somehow got a clue and they found him. They hadn't gone far in school, didn't have much credibility. The leaders heard it and believed just enough to make them want to kill the newborn king. So God said to Joseph, get up and go to Egypt. How? I imagine seated before me are very wealthy people, entrepreneurs, folk with the know-how. But if someone awakened you at night and told you to get up immediately and go to a foreign land, most of you couldn't do it. You'd have to wait until the banks open the next day. But on the other hand, you have credit cards. Joseph didn't. Then how on earth would he do this? It's very clear, and it's all right there in the Bible. While men slept, Messiah, Emmanuel, 
the promised seed, the deliverer. The seed of David's line was born in Bethlehem. And at the temple they had put things away and had gone to sleep. The priests, who should have been watching, didn't know what was happening. The Pharisees had been miscalculating. The publicans had been tabulating. And all the while, coming from the east were men called wise men. Men with limited knowledge, they didn't know everything. Let me call it incomplete knowledge. But at least they had the wisdom to follow the light which they had. And as they followed that light, they were led to the place where Jesus lay. Impressed, but impressed before they got there. The Spirit of the Lord told them to get some gifts and carry to this newborn king. Nobody over there will do it. You do it. And they brought gold and myrrh and frankincense. Thus they became the underwriters for the Egyptian journey and sustenance for an extended period of time for a family in crisis. The underwriters, the wise men. Tradition says they went down to a place today called Matarea. My wife and I have been there, if it's really the truth. And there he stayed until Herod was dead. Later on, our Lord was anointed the Christ. Three and a half years later, he made an announcement from the cross. It is finished. And he dropped his head in the hollow of his shoulder, yielded up the ghost, and died. But bless God, he rose up from the dead. I want to hear somebody say amen to that. He lives. He rose up from the dead. Now, it seems to me, if I had risen, I would have gone to Pilate to say, You see, I told you. I would have gone into the residence of the high priest. And I would have shown myself, but Christ didn't do that. Their time will come. His church needed him and got his first attention. These poor, depressed disciples, this little group that lived through the great disappointment, this little ragtag outfit, unlettered for the most part, poor and crude, they rejoiced in his presence, and they heard him say, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You folks, go into all the world. How on earth could they possibly do it? The greatest commission, the greatest responsibility. Not only that, he said, Go without money, without scrip, without purses. And the record is, they did. They started in Judea and then planned a campaign over in Samaria where some pre-evangelistic campaign work had been done by a woman who met Jesus at a well. Now, folks, it was not so simple as it seems. There were miracles, yes. There were signs, yes. There were wonders, yes. But also a lot of hard work and there were expenses. And so earnest prayer was required. There was a part for others to play. Budgets had to be secured. And the General Conference Committee over at Jerusalem had many things to think about. Well, when I read the story, I remember that there was a fellow over in Jerusalem named Nicodemus. A Greek name coming from Nick Demon. The word rabbi also is a Greek word. Over there was a man named Nicodemus. In the history that I found, he was Nicodemus ben Gurion, the son of Gurion, his surname. He was utterly and altogether rich. He was a temple ruler, a member of the Sanhedrin. Not much is written about him in the Bible, but Babson, the economist, said he could have supported the entire city for one year out of his own pocket. And Batson said it would require at least a million dollars a year. 
So we may conclude from that that he was a multi-billionaire. But when he wanted to see Jesus, he came by night. Rich people are often like that. Very private, you see, and not wanting to be identified until they have made a commitment. Desire of Ages says he was afraid that by his example he might mislead somebody. He was not about wrecking the temple procedures. Yet he had position. He had prestige. And this was a part of his struggle. Jesus had said, it's hard for a rich man to be saved. Hard for a rich man to be saved. And nothing has changed. I read not long ago of an athlete who went to a shoe store and at one fitting bought $26,000 worth of shoes. Oh, that's not worse than these cheating CEOs who are now building $15 million homes by the side of the sea. Rich people are often like that. In John chapter 2, you get a preparation for Nicodemus' visit with Jesus. Signs and wonders were following the Lord, and these stirred up the people. People are always willing to gawk at signs and wonders. You can get their attention with that, and Christ was a wonder worker. Now, in return, they were willing to give him two things, praise and celebration. Doesn't that sound contemporary? Praise and celebration. But they missed something vital. The temple police were sent over to listen to Jesus, and if they caught him saying the wrong thing, arrest him and bring him back to the temple leaders. But when they got back without him, their word was, we couldn't. He spoke as one having authority. You might notice that they softened it a little bit. Why, the Pharisees spoke as ones having authority. Jesus was the authority. He spoke as the Son of God, and this struck home to the hearts of the police. So there's more to it than just praise. They said, never did a man speak like this man. His word was with power. If we're really going to praise him, we've got to listen to his word, and then act and react to that word bringing by His power our lives into harmony with His Word. Because His Word isn't going to change. We have to do the changing. So when the people came praising, in the 24th verse of chapter 2, the Bible says, Jesus knew them all. Some of them were flattering in their praise. Some of them were yelling and all kinds of stuff going on. But Jesus knew them. He knew who was sincere. He could read their hearts. That's why he said later on, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How can I be your Lord when you will not obey me? And so these individuals did not accept that Jesus came from God, that he was Lord of the Sabbath. At the marriage feast in Cana, mentioned in that chapter, there was a sign that revealed his glory. And so we come to chapter 3, and Nicodemus is introduced. And Jesus knew him too. And because he did, he cut to the chase. He didn't spend a lot of time just socializing. He got right to the point. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. I know why you've come, and in order to get it, you've got to be born again. Why, that was almost inhospitable uh, to say to a temple ruler like Nicodemus. What a thing to say to a ranking officer of the temple at Jerusalem. And on top of that, he was fabulously rich. Now, it seems to me that Nicodemus represented the interests of a small group of whispering Pharisees. Because he used the plural subjective pronoun. He said, Rabbi, we, not I, we, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. We'll go that far. We will accommodate you to that extent. You are a teacher sent from God. But don't get out of joint over that. Moses was too. And Elijah was too. 
had some say John the Baptist was too. Nicodemus talking to Jesus. He made three statements in verses 2, 4, and 9, to which Jesus responded with the words, I solemnly assure you, this is down to business here. In the authorized version it says, verily, verily. I solemnly assure you, you have come to me, I'm telling you the truth, you cannot find a way around it. So Nicodemus' concession was theologically inadequate. Christ is saying to him, you can't even understand what I'm talking about without the new birth. And all of us need to take that in. You can't even understand what I'm saying to you. You will go away confused. The Son of Man must ascend to the Father, and the Holy Spirit then will come down. He is now claiming divinity. Christ is claiming divinity. Faith must accept this. This is the benefit that comes from the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't get it without the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 22, someone else had said to him, Teacher, is it lawful to render to kings that which belongs to their rule? In another place, one said, Teacher, what good thing must I do that I might inherit eternal life? Here is this patronizing idea. The, the same one that Nicodemus brought to the interview. Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus, I have come from God, but not as you suppose. Just a preacher approved of God. Man enters into this world because his father begets him. Man enters into the kingdom of grace because his heavenly father begets him. Life comes to man by his father. Eternal life comes to man by his heavenly father. Flesh, learning, the proliferation of degrees, an understanding of the law cannot reveal this to you. You must be born again. The Holy Spirit must come into your mind. And Christ contrasts flesh and spirit. And he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes because you can't see it. And when Jesus talked to him like that, he was obviating human importance, prestige, reputation, position. It bloweth where it listeth. Oh, I'm a witness. My soul was thrilled by the testimonies I heard last night. And then uh, those young people, I tell you the truth, it's amazing. The spirit bloweth where it listeth. And I think of a meeting I ran in California, and a prostitute confided into me that that was her profession. We baptized her, and seven years later, I found her as a Bible worker, bringing men and women to Christ. The Spirit bloweth where it listeth. It is not particularly concerned about how much we have in the bank or where we live. It bloweth where it listeth. And if we are born of the Spirit, and then born of the water, Nicodemus was a bit turned off. He had no faith in baptism. This was a new rite, I read, for proselyting non-Jews into the Jewish family. But Jesus is a baptizer. And he tells this man, you've got to be born of the water. And so after the interview, Nicodemus would fade back into the darkness from which he came. But there was a little ember burning in his heart, and he would never be the same again. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicodemus is mentioned two more times in the book of John. The people hearing him stand up in defense of Jesus. Now focus on Bethlehem. He is from Galilee. How can it be that you are focusing on Jesus from Galilee when he should come from Bethlehem? Well, when they should have believed that, they wouldn't. The shepherds tried to tell them. The wise men came. The temple policemen came back and told them. And the Pharisees said to them, so you've been fooled too. We represent authority around here. You don't see anyone of, of us following him, do you? Nicodemus was hit by this. And when they appealed to the law, he said, Since when does our law condemn a man without hearing him first? 
And so the issue is forced. And they turned on Nicodemus. They asked him, are you also a Galilean? And then as if to laugh in his face, they said, no prophet ever came from Galilee. And that wasn't true either. That's where Jonah had come from. But glory to God, after the crucifixion, there was a resurrection. And the mind of Nicodemus was cleared. I want to read to you from Desire of Ages. The disciples were scattered. He came forward. He had seen Jesus lifted up as he talked about in the interview. He felt the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church. He was as firm as a rock, encouraging the disciples and furnishing the means to carry forward the work. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence. He became poor in this world's goods. He faltered not in faith, which had its beginning in the night conference with Jesus. He became the blessed underwriter of the Acts of the Apostles. Let us look then quickly at a more recent great disappointment. In 1844, nearly 500,000 believers... We're looking toward October 22, but when it didn't happen, they were embarrassed and bitterly disappointed, and many fled. Some became atheistic, never again to claim faith in the Lord or in His Word. But God said to the prophet, Thou must prophesy again. You've got to do it again, this time, before every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And out of that, God extracted a remnant willing to do anything He said. And most of them were poor folks. One man mowed Timothy Hay all day to get 75 cents so that he could become the underwriter of the publishing work. What a mighty God we serve. Ron Wright baptized 4,600 people in Niamira, Kenya. I went out there to preach. And 6,000 people were sitting on the ground in western attire with a light mist falling. I choked up so I couldn't begin. And then I thought in my heart, somebody send a shelter to these people. And it's my understanding that somebody here today provided that shelter and underwriter for the work of the living God. Well, my closing time has come. I see it very clearly. But I want us to know we're in the last days. If you don't know it, you better cut that TV off and read your Bible and pray. Because some things will be revealed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And may I also urge you not only to do that, but to study the spirit of prophecy inside information which God has given us for this hour. You see all of those things all around you today. And not only do you see them, but these capricious acts of nature... Disaster by land and sea, storms, hurricanes, and so forth. They are happening now. People are being flooded in one area, parched in another, while the middle of the country burns. These are signs that Christ will come soon. And the Lord's servant says he's not trying to destroy life, but to wake us up. Wake us up. I feel being here with you that you've got a head start. But soon the volcanoes will vomit molten rock. The earth will belch and hiss and cuss. The seas will run amok and pound on their breasts. The lightning will rage and threaten a holocaust. The thunder will bellow and the winds will wail. What's going on? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Prepare. Prepare. You've been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International Copyright 2002, American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. For additional cassettes by this speaker or for a free catalog of other American Cassette Ministry cassettes, please contact us as follows. To order toll-free in the United States and Canada, dial 800-233-4450. For international calls, dial 717-652-7000. For fax orders, dial 717-652-9050. Our internet email address is info at americancassette.org. 
Other cassettes may also be ordered from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. Our entire catalog is online, and we accept MasterCard, Visa, and Discover credit cards. Or you may simply write to American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 17108, in the United States of America. Maintaining the integrity of the Three Angels' messages for 27 years, American Cassette Ministries request your continued prayers and financial support as we strive to provide you with the finest, most powerful spiritual messages available. Our one purpose in ministry, to prepare you and your loved ones to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.